Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Boston Her Story, uh, Remarkable Women with the Boston Women's Heritage Trail. Uh, in celebration of International Women's Month, Jennifer Craig, uh, Greg, who is the president of the Boston Women's Heritage Trail, is here with us this afternoon. We're going to examine some of the remarkable women who lived and worked in Boston. We're going to explore their lives and their achievements and how they've influenced the history of Boston and beyond. So Jennifer is a professor in the communication department. She's actually the head of the department at, at UMass Boston and is current president of the Boston Women, Women's Heritage Trail. Uh, the trail works to highlight the accomplishments of women and restore their rightful place in the history of Boston. The trail has created 13 walks throughout Boston and produced a guidebook to commemorate more than 200 women who changed history in a wide variety of settings, occupations, and backgrounds. Uh, the trail also sponsors teacher workshops and works with Boston Public Schools to offer free tours to Boston Public uh, School students and their teachers. And I again want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library and the 12 other libraries here in Massachusetts who are uh, collaborating for this event. Uh, so all uh, 80 plus of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jennifer for joining us this afternoon. And Jennifer, you can take it away. Thanks so Great. much. Great. Thank you so much, Robert. And thanks everyone for joining us. I know some of those uh, distant people in California and Texas are uh, family members of mine and Nebraska. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. I appreciate it. So as Robert said, I'm a teacher at heart. Um, so here's your first quiz for the day. I don't know how clearly you can see it, but I am wearing a purple and white scarf. So your first quiz of the day is why am I wearing a purple and a white scarf in celebration of Women's History Month? So you can post your answers in the chat and we'll see who can get it right. So as Robert said, um, I am president of the Boston Women's Heritage Trail. And in 1776, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, John, who was at the Continental Congress, Remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Most of us will admit in the following 200 years, there wasn't a lot of recognition of women who helped shape Boston and beyond. And in 1989, that began to change when the, a group of Boston public school teachers, librarians, and their students inaugurated the Boston Women's Heritage Trail. And we've been doing work for the last 30 years, as Robert mentioned, to restore women to their rightful place in the history of Boston and the school curriculum. Uh, I'm so happy to hear that we have a group of students with us today, and uh, I look forward to hearing your questions. So thank you for joining me in celebration of Women's History Month. Let's spend a little bit of time learning about Boston's notable women. We're about to go on several of the sites of the Boston Women's Heritage Trail. The Boston Women's Heritage Trail began in 1989, and it features famous women from all the centuries, which is close to four centuries in Boston history. And so I want to introduce you to three pretty fabulous women. This is Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley lived in the Revolutionary Era, and she was the first African-American to publish a book of poems. Now, what's really interesting about this whole group of women here is that historically, women have been put on pedestals, and if a woman's on a pedestal, she can't get anything done. So the sculptor here, Meredith Bergman, has put each of these women working on her pedestal. This is Abigail Adams. Abigail Adams was the wife of John Adams, who was both vice president and president. She gave him a lot of advice, especially from a woman's perspective, as to what to do as he was creating the code of laws and working during the American Revolution. This is Lucy Stone. She ran the Women's Journal, which was one of the most important women's newspapers for suffrage in the U.S. One thing that's cool about Lucy, cool about all this, is that kids come here, they sit here, and they go, wow, I could be like Lucy Stone, I could be like Phyllis Wheatley, I could be like Abigail Adams, I could be a woman and change the world, I could be anyone and change the world. We're standing at 28 Commonwealth Ave, which was once the home of Amy Beach. 
Amy Beach was the first American woman to compose a symphony, the first one to have a piece performed by the Boston Symphony Orchestra and also by the Handel and Haydn Society. But from childhood, she was a musical prodigy. In 2000, a group of people lobbied to get her mentioned on the hat shell on the Esplanade, because the hat shell in all the in, in the stonework has the names of 87 composers. So there are 87 men and Amy Beach on the hat shell. We're in the public garden right now. We're in these stalls for the swan boats. The swan boats have been going around here since 1877. A lot of people assume that the city of Boston runs the swan boats, but the truth is the Paget family has been running this since the 1870s. Now, Robert gets all the credit. However, the fact is he died a year later in 1878, and his wife, Julia Paget, not knowing what else to do and needing a way to make a living for the family, took over and ran the swan boats for more than three decades after that until her death. We're in the public garden, and we are here with Mrs. Mallard and her ducklings, which is arguably the most popular statue in all of Boston. Um, in 1941, Robert McCloskey wrote a book, Make Way for Ducklings, um, about Mrs. Mallard and her ducklings. And what happened was on the 150th anniversary of the public garden in 1987, they decided that they wanted to have uh, something to commemorate Mrs. Mallard and her ducklings. And so they employed uh, a Newton-based artist named Nancy Schoen. So let's take a few minutes to learn a little bit more about the women featured in the Boston Women's Memorial. Uh, the next time you're in Boston, it's on Commonwealth Avenue between Fairfield and Gloucester Streets. And as mentioned in the video, the artist is Meredith Bergman, who is the artist that just um, had the dedication of the new uh, statue in New York City uh, for women's suffrage. So Abigail Adams was born in 1744 in Weymouth. Her father was a congregational minister and her cousin was Dorothy Quincy, who was married to John Hancock. Abigail was not formally educated. She could read and she could write and she could do arithmetic. And she was very well known as a critical thinker. She was an advocate of married women's property rights and more opportunities for women, particularly in the field of education. She did not believe that women should submit to laws not made in their interest, nor should they be content with the simple role of being companions to their husbands. She believed that women should educate themselves and thus be recognized for their intellectual capabilities so that they could guide and influence the lives of their children and their husbands. She met John Adams in 1759 when she was just 15 years old. Her father approved of their relationship, but her mother was appalled because she felt that John Adams was a country lawyer and that Abigail should look out for somebody better than just a country lawyer. Clearly they married in 1764. They had six children. She was the mother of John Quincy Adams. And so this brings us to our second quiz. What, she was one of only two women to be married to a president and to be the mother of a president. So you can put in the chat, who was the other woman to be married to a president and mother of a president? Much of what we know about Abigail and John's presidency was because of their very frequent correspondence. Her Remember the Ladies letter, as I mentioned before, was sent to John at the Continental Congress. He replied, somewhat jokingly to her appeal, expressing a fear of the despotism of the petticoat. 
Abigail Adams believed that slavery was evil and a threat to American democracy. A letter that she wrote on March 31st, 1776, explained that she doubted most of the Virginians who had such a passion for liberty because they claim, even though they claimed they did, how could they have this passion for liberty when they quote, deprived their fellow creatures of freedom? She was so politically active, in fact, her political opponents came to refer to her as Mrs. President. They thought she was too outspoken. She was well-informed on issues, um, particularly those facing her husband's administration. She uh, was known to write uh, letters to the newspaper um, and planting favorable stories about her husband in the press. And um, she was the first lady to reside at the White House. Abigail Adams died of typhoid fever, just shy of 74 years old. Phyllis Wheatley is the first published African-American poet. She was one of the best known poets in pre 19th century America. Wheatley was likely seized from Senegal or Gambia in West Africa when she was about seven years old. When she was brought to the colonies, she was either too young or too frail for work in the South. So she was transported north on a ship called the Phyllis. She was purchased as a slave by the Wheatley family in Boston. <clears throat> and the Wheatley family quickly came to understand that she was very intelligent. And the Wheatley son and daughter then taught her to read and write. Her first poem was published in 1770 in Boston. There's some talk, uh, research that she possibly had a poem published earlier in 1767 in Newport, Rhode Island, but that hasn't been clearly verified. So um, most people still use 1770 as her first published work. She then went to London with the Wheatley family in 1771 looking for a publisher because U.S. publishers would not publish works by an African. In fact, colonists in the soon to be U.S., found it difficult to believe that an African slave could write such what they called excellent poetry, quote, that Wheatley, in fact, had to defend her authorship of her poetry in court in 1772. While she was in London, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, was published in 1773. And it, as I said, it was the first volume of poetry published by an African-American in modern times. She was a celebrity in London. She had several royal patrons and in fact had a bigger following in England and Europe than here at the time. She likely wrote about 145 poems. She was released from slavery by the Wheatley family late in 1773 after her book was published, shortly before Mrs. Wheatley died in 1774. At the time, she continued to live with Mr. Wheatley and the Wheatley daughter, but they both died in 1778, leaving Phyllis with no security or livelihood. She then married John Peters, even though many of her friends disapproved. He, he could read and write. He um, sometimes called himself a lawyer. He often worked as a grocer. He thought of himself as an entrepreneur. But that wasn't really sustainable at this time for a Black man, because after the war, jobs were scarce and free Blacks were competing with whites for jobs. And we can imagine how that was going to work. So Phyllis and John were often in extreme poverty, and Phyllis was often left to fend for herself because he would be off looking for work uh, and, and, in fact, sometimes found himself in jail. When she died in 1784, her husband was in fact in jail because of his debts. Her last surviving child died at the same time and was buried with her. Lucy Stone was a suffragist, an abolitionist, and the first Massachusetts woman to earn a college degree. She was born in West Brookfield, Mass as one of nine children. Her father was very domineering and did not see why women needed to be educated, particularly a college education. So at the age of 16, she worked as a teacher, saving her money so that she could attend college because her father refused to pay for a girl to go to school. In 1839, she spent a semester at Mount Holyoke. 
She was forced to return home due to a sister's illness after that semester. And also her very progressive views were not a fit with the very conservative school. So then in 1843, she attended Oberlin College in Ohio. Even progressive Oberlin, however, did not permit Lucy Stone to explore her interest in public speaking. When she graduated in 1847, Oberlin gave her the honor of writing the commencement speech. However, she was not allowed to deliver the speech. It would be read by a man. So she declined the honor of writing the commencement speech. She was almost 30 when she completed her education and her career prospects seemed pretty dim because there were very few professions open to women at the time. Renowned abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, though, hired her for his American Anti-Slavery Society. She wrote and delivered abolitionist speeches while also becoming active in women's rights. Like other female abolitionists, she was often heckled, and we know that at least once she was phys physically attacked by a mob. But she became so popular that she was soon out earning many of the male lecturers at the time. In 1850, two years after the Seneca Falls uh, Women's Rights Convention, Stone organized the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester. A few years after that, she met Henry Blackwell, who was the brother of famous physicians Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell of New York, and Henry convinced her to marry him by promising they would create an egalitarian marriage. So they wrote their, um, their vows intended for publication, and they published them in 1855, and the vows omitted the reference to wifely obedience and included a protest against marital law. And Lucy Stone set a new standard because she was the first woman in the US to keep her last name. She did not take the Blackwell name. In 1869, she split from suffragists Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony among, with others uh, over the passage of the 14th and 15th amendments. Um, Lucy Stone was willing to accept uh, the 14th and 15th Amendments because of her abolitionist goals while continuing to work with women's suffrage, whereas Stanton and Anthony were not uh, uh, interested in accepting the 14th and 15th Amendments. Lucy and her husband went on to publish the Woman's Journal, which was a weekly suffragist periodical in January of 1870. The Woman's Journal was active until 1917 when it was purchased and re renamed. Um, Alice Stone Blackwell, her daughter, was the editor for the last 25 years of the publication of the Woman's Journal. In 1879, Lucy Stone registered to vote in Massachusetts because the state allowed women's suffrage in some local elections, particularly things like school boards. However, she was removed from the voter registration list because she did not use her husband's name. So she would have been allowed to vote, but because she kept her name, she was not allowed to vote. Julia Ward Howe is best known as the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. She also co-founded the American Woman Suffrage Association. She was a writer, a lecturer, an abolitionist, a suffragist. She was the daughter of wealthy New York banker and was a descendant of Roger Williams who founded the Rhode Island Colony in 1636. Julia met her husband, Dr. Samuel Howe, when she was touring the New England Institute for the Blind with her friend, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Howe was about 20 years older than Julia, but she was smitten. They married quickly and had six children. Her husband liked her ideals, but did not like the public acclaim she was getting for her poetry and her abolitionist publications. 
he believed a woman's place was in the home. He was controlling, he was sometimes violent, and he mismanaged the money she had inherited from her father. Uh, but she stayed in the marriage because he threatened to keep the children from her if she divorced him. So she stayed in the marriage, she studied languages, she studied philosophy, she supported his causes and began writing and getting more involved in public life. He was not very happy about her getting involved in public life, but he let her do it because she was a, an accomplished uh, writer and brought uh, recognition to the abolitionist cause. Because of, the, of her and her husband's work in the Sanitary Commission, they were invited to Washington by President Lincoln. They visited a union camp and heard men singing John Brown's body. And the clergyman at the camp asked her to write a new song for the war effort. She wrote the poem, Battle Hymn of the Republic, which was published in February, 1862 in the Atlantic Monthly. She was active in the women's rights movement uh, later in her life, and she played a prominent role in several suffrage organizations. In fact, working with Lucy Stone to help found the Women's Journal. And she was an editor for the Women's Journal and a writer for it. And she participated in uh, women's clubs at the time. After the Civil War, she tried to get a formal Mother's Day for Peace approved as a, a national uh, day recognizing mothers. Um, her idea was that this day would celebrate an opposition to war in all forms. She wasn't successful, but we do have Mother's Day today in part because of the work she did in trying to get that uh, Mother's Day for Peace passed. And Mother's Day, in fact, was first celebrated in West Virginia in 1907. Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler was the first African-American woman daughter, a, a doctor, excuse me. She was born in 1831 in Delaware, and she was raised by an aunt in Pennsylvania who spent much of her time caring for sick neighbors. Um, Crumpler wrote that this influenced her choice of career. In 1852, she moved to Charlestown, where she worked as a nurse without formal training because the first formal nursing school didn't open until 1873. But she worked alongside doctors who were so uh, pleased with her work that they then wrote letters of recommendation for her to go to medical school. In 1860, she was admitted to the New England Female Medical College. She received her doctorate of medicine in 1864 from the New England Female Medical College which later merged with the Boston University School of Medicine in 1873. So she was the only African-American woman to graduate from what was then known as the New England Female College, uh, Female Medical College. She moved to Richmond, Virginia in 1865 to care for freed slaves after the Civil War, and then returned to Boston in the late 1860s and focused on women and children and emphasized nutrition and preventative medicine. She moved to Hyde Park sometime around 1880, and she then published uh, the book, A Book of Medical Discourses in Two Parts in 1883. It is considered the first medical publication by an African-American, and the focus is on medical care of women and children. It also included chapters on advice for men and women on how to ensure a happy marriage. She said the secret to a successful marriage quote, is to continue in the careful routine of the courting days till it becomes well understood between the two. By most accounts, she was not practicing medicine at this time any, any longer by the late 1880s. She died in 1895, and she and her husband, Arthur, were buried in unmarked graves until July of 2020, when a fundraiser was held to, held to create gravestones for the couple who are now who are buried at Fairview Cemetery, and you can now uh, find and locate their um, their gravestones. Now you'll notice this slide is a little different because we don't have a picture of Dr. Crumpler. There are no known uh, images of her, so we we do not have a picture of Dr. Crumpler. Ellen Swallow. Richards was born in Dunstable, Mass in 1842. She was mainly educated at home 
um, until she started at Vassar College in 1868. Vassar was exclusively for women at the time, and she graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1870. She was trained as a chemist and applied for jobs as a chemist, but was turned down for every job that she applied for. She was then admitted to MIT in 1870 as a, quote, special student because women were not allowed to be students at MIT at the time. So she was the first woman to study at MIT. She was awarded a BS in chemistry in 1873 and a master's in chemistry from Vassar at the same time. She earned the doctoral degree in 1875, but the board of trustees at MIT refused to award it because MIT didn't want the first graduate degree in chemistry to be awarded to a woman. In fact, the first doctoral degree didn't go to a woman until 1886. Ellen Swallow Richard married uh, Robert Richards, who was chair of the Eng mine engineering department at MIT in 1875. And they went on to establish what was known as the women's laboratory that year. And this was the place where women who were uh, accepted as special students could do their laboratory work. And when women were then later admitted to regular courses at MIT, Swallow Richards closed the lab and established the Cheney Reading Room, which is still in existence today, um, named after uh, former student Margaret Swan Cheney, who's the daughter of philanthropist Edna Dow Littlehale Cheney. If you're a local, you might know that name. Swallow Richards continued to teach at MIT. She was unpaid until 1884. She continued to do research in sanitary chemistry and engineering, and she's uh, said to have coined the term ecology because she studied air, water, and food. Swallow Richards pioneered the, the field of sanitary engineering and home economics. In 1887, she conducted research that led to the first state water quality standards in the nation. And she, uh, her research was the, backbone for the first modern municipal sewage treatment plant in Lowell, Massachusetts. From 1887 to 97, she served as an official water analyst for the State Board of Health in Massachusetts while continuing as an instructor at MIT, uh, the, the rank she held until her death. She was very concerned about applying scientific principles to domestic topics like good nutrition and eating healthy food and physical fitness and sanitation. She was interested in any practices that would allow women more time for pursuits other than cooking and cleaning. Vassar, uh, Richards served as a trustee for Vassar for many years and was uh, awarded an honorary PhD from Smith College in 1910. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin was born in Boston in 1842, and her earliest public service was recruiting African-American men for the Massachusetts Infantry for the Civil War. After the Civil War, she participated in several clubs and service organizations and was well known for moving between the Black and white communities. She joined with Julia Ward Howe and Lucy Stone to form the American Woman Suffrage Association in 1869. She wrote for the Black Weekly paper, The Courant, and was a member of the New England Women's Press Association. In 1890, she started the Women's Era newspaper, which was the first national newspaper by and for Black women. She undertook all of the editing and all of the publishing. She wrote an editorial for every issue. She recruited correspondents to contribute from around the country. And the new newspaper served as a vehicle really to document the achievements and the strengths of African-American women. She and her daughter, Florida Ruffin Ridley, who was the second African-American teacher in Boston Public Schools, along with school principal Maria Baldwin, then founded the Women's Era Club in 1893. The Women's Era Club offered its members opportunities for self-improvement and to address issues affecting the African-American community particularly things like local politics, education, and the debilitating discrimination of Black Americans in the South. Suffrage was not the primary goal of the club, but members of the club were actively engaged in the suffrage 
movement. And the women's era newspaper quickly became nationally recognized as the voice of black women. Ruffin organized the National Conference of Colored Women in, in uh, 1895, which was the first national conference of black women. And at the end of the conference, the women formed the National Federation of Afro-American Women, and which merged with the Colored Women's League to form the National Association of Co Colored Women in 1896. The club was accepted by the Massachusetts State Federation of Women's Clubs. If you're interested in the women's clubs movement at the time, it's a fascinating story of women uh, and the suffrage movement and, and women's rights. So Florida Ruffin's, uh, uh, St. Pierre Ruffin's uh, club was accepted in Massachusetts, but the national membership was refused because there was a fear that they might offend Southern members because it was a black women's club. Josephine uh, supported the local suffrage movement. She joined and accepted leadership positions in local and national suffrage organizations, many of which were dominated by white women. She organized meetings at churches and private homes, and she had local leaders, including William Lloyd Garrison and Lucy Stone, who spoke at her meetings in favor of women's rights. Amy Cheney Beach was born in 1867 in New Hampshire. And as mentioned in the video, she was a child prodigy. She was able to sing 40 songs accurately by the time she was a year old. She was improvising counter melodies by the time she was two, and she taught herself to read at the age of three. She composed three waltzes for the piano during the summer when she was four. At the time she was staying at her grandfather's farm where there was no piano. She began her formal music lessons at age six and was giving public recitals soon after, and she made her concert debut at the age of 16 in Boston. She got married at age 18. Her husband, who was a surgeon, was about 25 years older than she was, and he placed restrictions on her performing. In fact, she was only allowed to perform two public concerts per year after she got married. So that's when she started composing. She was basically self-taught because her husband wouldn't let her take classes or have a tutor. So she was one of the first American composers to succeed without European training. And she was one of the most respected and acclaimed American composers of her time. Her mass in E-flat major was the first work by a woman to be performed by the Handel and Hayden Society with the Boston Symphony Orchestra in 1892. Music critics called her one of America's foremost composers and compared the piece, her, her masses, to those of Bach. Later that year, she was the first woman to have an aria performed by the New York Symphony Orchestra. And in 1896, the Gaelic Symphony, which we're hearing now, was the first symphony composed and published by an American woman. It premiered in Boston with exceptional success. Critics tied her successes to her sex but other composers at the time thought of her as one of the boys. And she was included in what is known as the Boston Six, a group of classical composers who lived in New England, mostly in Boston at the time. Musicologists today consider this group to be the pioneers of classical music in the US. And many were leaders in music education in the US. In 1900, Amy Beach premiered her own piano concerto with the BSO and later performed it in Europe was very highly regarded. In all, she wrote more than 150 works from chamber and orchestral works to church music and songs. And she used her status as the top female composer to further the careers of young musicians. After her husband's death in 1910, she worked as a music educator. She was the composer in residence at St. Bart's Episcopal Church in New York City. She served on the board of counselors of the New England Conservatory. She was in high demand as a speaker and performer, and she created what she called the Beach Clubs to teach and educate children in music. 
She was the first president of the Society of American Women Composers. And as mentioned in the video, her name was added to the hat shell in 2000. Jenny Leutman Barron was born in 1891, and she was one of four daughters of Russian immigrant parents. She grew up in Boston's West End. They didn't have much material wealth, but her mother spoke five languages and believed that education and learning was critically important. Their home was a meeting place, place for new immigrants who needed an interpreter as they were uh, moving to America. Leutman Barron graduated as valedictorian from Girls High School in Boston at the age of 15 and went straight to college. She sold books door to door and she taught Americanization classes to immigrants at night while studying at BU. She earned her four year degree from BU in only three years and was awarded her law degree two years after that. While she was in college, she organized the Boston University Equal Suffrage League. And once suffrage was granted, she worked with the League of Women Voters to address irregular marriage and divorce laws across the country. In 1914, uh, Leutman Barron received her Master of Law degree from BU, and it was one of few women to earn the, such a high degree. She opened her own law practice in 1914. In 1918, she married her childhood sweetheart, and they opened a joint practice, which was open until 1934. In 1918, she organized a campaign to allow women to become notaries. And in 1924, she was the first woman on the Boston School Committee. In 1934, she was appointed Assistant Attorney General of Massachusetts, hence the closing of her private practice. She became the first woman to try a major criminal case in the state. She was the first woman to present evidence to a grand jury in Massachusetts. And she became Massachusetts' first full-time woman judge in 1937. She served for 30 years, 20 in the Boston Municipal Court. And then in 1957, she was appointed as the first woman to the Massachusetts Superior Court, where she served for 10 years. In 1950, she represented the League of Women Voters and won the right for women to serve on juries. She was also the first female U.S. delegate to the United Nations Congress on Crime and Juvenile Delinquency, and she served on the bench until a week before her death at the age of 77. Melnia Cass is known as the First Lady of Roxbury. She was a community and civil rights activist who was deeply active in many community projects, particularly in Boston South End and Roxbury. If you're a local, you'll hear, you've heard of the intersection Mass and Cass, so named for Melnia Cass. She was born in Virginia and moved to the South End when she was a child. Her mother died when she was eight and she was raised by an aunt who sent her to a Catholic girls school in Virginia for high school. When she returned to Boston in 1914, she couldn't find work in retail and was forced into domestic work. This became the starting point for her community activism. In the 30s, she then worked to open employment for African-Americans in stores and in hospitals. Her focus was on urban renewal, on minority employment, on educational equality for children. She got involved as a community activist during World War I when her husband was deployed. Um, she was uh, active in the Women's Service Club and then started uh, one of what was known as the Knitting Clubs to knit scarves for gloves and, and gloves for soldiers. And she later became president of the Women's Club uh, for 15 years and guided it through a community agenda uh, of organization and, and, and political organization as well. After World War I, she was actively assisting women with voter registration after the 19th Amendment passed. She helped found the Boston chapter of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1925, which was the first labor organization led by African-Americans. Um, she was active in desegregating Boston public schools. She was a pioneer in the daycare movement. During World War II, she was one of the organizers of Women in Community Service, which later became Boston's sponsor of the Job Corps. 
1949, she helped found Freedom House with Muriel Snowden, um, which is a nonprofit community-based organization dedicated to human rights and advocacy for African-Americans in Boston. In 1961, Melnia Cass was appointed by the mayor as the only female charter member to Action for Boston uh, Community Development, which assisted people who lost their homes to urban renewal. She was president of the Boston NAACP, and in the 1970s, she was chairperson for the Massachusetts Advisory Committee for the Elderly. In the 60s and 70s, she was particularly active securing rights for migrant women of color, uh, particularly from the South and the Caribbean islands, who were promised high wages and educational opportunities by manipulative employment agencies. She conducted official investigations by the NAACP, and these investigations resulted in closure of these rogue employment agencies. Her, because of her leadership, the state legislature then passed mandated agency licensure for domestic workers. And in 1970, the, uh, Massachusetts passed the nation's first state level minimum wage protections for domestic workers since the Great Depression. So it took, you know, 40 years uh, for some additional protections. In um, 1966, the very first Melnia Cast Day was declared in Boston by Mayor John Collins. Uh, it's been celebrated on May 22nd since then. And in 1977, Mayor Kevin White hosted an event honoring seven grand Bostonians, and she was one of them. There are a number of uh, buildings, including the Boston YWCA on Clarendon Street, named in her honor. I'm gonna watch my time and go through just two more. Uh, Ruby Fu is from our newest trail uh, on the Boston Women's Heritage Trail website. Uh, you'll find Women Feeding Boston. Ruby Fu moved to Boston in 1923, where she began a single room restaurant in Boston's Chinatown. Its popularity quickly grew and she opened Ruby Fu's Den on Hudson Street in 1929, which was heralded as the first Chinese restaurant to successfully cater to non-Chinese clientele. She was so successful during the 1930s that she opened a second location in New York City in 1936. In 1938, newspapers around the country ran a photo of a Chinese baby sitting amidst rubble in a Shanghai railway station that the Japanese had bombed. Ruby Fu had the child brought to the United States where she adopted him and raised him along with her other children. In 1939, her Boston restaurant offered delivery. And this is the first time that we know of a Chinese restaurant offering a delivery service. An article in the Lowell Sun newspaper mentioned that one of her hobbies at the time was flying an airplane. So not only was she a, an entrepreneur, a restaurateur, but she was a pilot. Then throughout World War II, Ruby Fu's Den remained a legendary meeting place for theater people, sports people, uh, other celebrities. They never had a liquor license. So people came to gather, to talk, but they didn't gather to drink. In 1948, the first Chinese canning factory in the US produced Ruby Fu Oriental food products, which were from Ruby Fu's chefs. She opened similar restaurants in Miami, in Washington, in Providence, in addition to the New York location, becoming nationally known as a restaurateur and a mentor to dozens of aspiring chefs here in Boston. She died unexpectedly in 1950 from a heart attack her, con her restaurant continued to operate under the management of her children. It continued to be very popular, especially with celebrities, until it closed in 1957. The last woman that I want to talk about is Kip Tiernan. Kip Tiernan was born in West Haven, Connecticut, and she was raised by her grandmother after the death of her parents. She was an activist for social and economic justice. She advocated, she protested, she lobbied for affordable and accessible housing, healthcare, education, jobs, civil rights, peace. She moved to Boston in 1947 to study at the Boston Conservatory, but she was expelled for drinking. 
After she achieved her sobriety, she had a very long career in adver advertising. Uh, she was an avid writer. She wrote numerous articles about civil rights and the anti-war movement. In 1974, Kip Tiernan founded Rosie's Place, America's first shelter for homeless women. It was founded in an abandoned supermarket she had seen women in the early 70s disguising themselves as men to get a free meal at men's only shelters. So she started to see this happening in Boston and she then went to Chicago, to Philadelphia, to New York to see what those cities were doing for women. And what she found is that they were doing nothing. It's as if homeless women didn't exist even though today between 30 and 40% of the homeless population are women. So she helped found a wide variety of community organizations to address the needs of people, especially the homeless and the hungry, including the Boston Food Bank, the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program, the Poor People's United Fund, and the Boston Women's Fund and Transition House. She was also one of the founders of Victory House in Boston South End, which is a residential alcoholism treatment program for homeless alcoholic men. So I am going to slide forward and end by saying that you can find more information on our website, including the women that I kind of slid past. Um, we have a guidebook that's available for purchase that uh, has a guide to all of the walks, except our newest walk is not in there yet. Um, you can, of course, make a donation to continue our work. Our latest project is a, ta a talking statues project where the women of the Boston's Women's Memorial will tell their own story. And I can't go into too many details about it, but once the talking statues are available, you will definitely recognize the, the voices of the women doing the um, voiceover. So I'm going to stop my share and um, I'm going to let uh robert direct me to any questions but first i gotta know did anybody get the answer for the purple scarf i think about uh 12 folks uh said uh it's the colors of the uh women's suffragettes yeah women's suffrage yeah women's suffragists um uh, wore white and purple scarves um as they were um you know marching for for women's right to vote now, here's what I didn't mention. It also would have either a yellow flower or a yellow bird attached or a button. They might be wearing a button. So the next time you're gonna get some flowers for your sweetie, you're gonna purchase yellow roses because yellow roses were the color of women's suffrage. Red roses were the roses carried by the people who did not believe women should be voting, right? So. Red roses, not the symbol of love. In fact, the symbol of you don't have the right to vote. So yellow roses next time you go to the store. What about our May question also, about the presidents? Yes, yes. Uh, also, yes, Barbara Bush was the popular author there. Let there you go. That. There you go. Barbara Bush. Oh, great. So uh, Barb says hello from Nebraska and Sherry says hello from California. So my sister your, and my uh, cousin. Oh, well, there you go. All right. Um, Gail says that she just signed up for your email list, the Trails email list. Um, she also says that Kip Tiernan was and is an inspiration and a tireless advocate for homeless women. Yes, very much uh, so. Freddie says, uh, this was terrific. Thank you, Jennifer and the Boston Women's Heritage Trail. Wendy asks, can you please repeat what percent of the homeless are women? About 30% today. Yeah, between 30 and 40%. Yeah. All right, Barbara asks, did a woman need to be living when the US was established to be included in your presentation? Uh, she's wondering about Anne Bradstreet, the first American poet in particular. Yeah, so um, we, ha we, <laughs> we have a number of criteria for women that we include in, uh, what, in the trails, in the trails projects. Um, you'll notice that none of them are living, right? So there are many amazing women in Boston that, um, that you know, are, are, will be included at some point, but, but we only focus on women who are, who are not living today. 
And um, they have to have a Boston connection. So they didn't necessarily have to be born in the US, but they do have a Boston connection among some other criteria that we have. And, you know, honestly, we, we are continuing to expand our trails. Um, our latest trail, the Women Feeding Boston, was um, just debuted last year. And it was actually the master's thesis project of a student at UMass Boston in their um, in the history department there. And that trail uh, will be expanded, you know, as we continue to work as well, because it's, it's uh, you know, an excellent new trail. We have another new trail coming out within the next several months. Um, so, um, so that's kind of, you know, we're, we're continuing to work as rapidly as we can. Uh, Irene says, thank you for this great program. Uh, Rekha says, thank you so much. Patricia says, very well done, thank you. Teresa says, so much great information presented, makes me wanna learn more. Michelle said, this was so interesting. I lived in Boston for many years and did not know about a lot of these, site, uh, a lot of these sites and statues. Can't wait to do these trails. Uh, and I'll say about that, if you have a smartphone, you can actually follow the trail on your phone from our website. And um, so if you don't want to carry the book, which we you know, encourage you to carry the book, but you can also follow the trail on your phone as you're you know, walking the, the various trails. If you want to do Beacon Hill or you want to do the West End or whatever it is, uh, you can follow along on your phone. So folks, as we approach three o'clock, I'll say our last call for questions. Uh, let's see, Robert says, you rock, Professor Greg. <laughs> and uh, Candy says that you're amazing. Um, RP you. says, uh, celebrate Mother's Day by strolling along the Mother's Walk in Boston as you seek out the Women's Trail. Uh, Gail says, thank you for all your efforts and this extensively researched presentation. Let's see, I don't wanna miss anyone. Let me go up a little bit here. Um, Kim asks, are there any openings for people who would love to voice a statue? Uh, send me an email and I will put you in charge, uh, put you in touch with the people who are in charge of that um, project. Um, right now we have a grant to do the women's memorial. So those three women uh, are being voiced by um, people that you will know. Uh, local mm. local voices that you will know, um, but as we you know hope to broaden the project, um, that you know we would love input from the community. We would love input. Uh, the the first one we're working on, we're we're getting it done, and it's going to debut I think this summer. Um, but then you know after that we'll be moving forward on to the next one. So yeah, send me an email. Um, I don't know if you saw it on there. I can put it in the chat. My um, mm. email address. Oh, I about gave you a typo. It's jennifer.greg at umb.edu. And I can uh, then send you on to the people who are in charge of that um, project. Uh, Lori asks, is your program in all Boston public high schools? It's in eighth grader. So eighth grade is middle school. Um, yes. And so we have a curriculum that was developed with Boston public schools with the school teachers that eighth graders uh, study as part of their um, eighth grade social studies projects. Uh, Joyce asks, any plans to add Native Americans to the trail since so many other institutions are adding the Massachusetts land acknowledgement to the Boston lands? Yeah, we actually have Native American women on the, um, on the uh, food trail. So there are, and there are, and again, you know, I, I sort of pick and chose just a handful of, um, women today, but we, we definitely have Native American women on our trails. Uh, great job, Jennifer, very interesting. Uh, that was from uh, Jereen. Uh, Kim says, thank you. Uh, Barbara asks, will the recording be made available? And yes, Barbara, I'm gonna email everyone who is on the call uh, with the recording uh, later today. A Couple more questions here. Uh, is there a book on the founder of Rosie's Place? You know, I have not seen a book on her. Um, there is a lot of information on the web and actually Rosie's Place website has excellent information, um, but I have not seen an actual book about her. Uh, Pat says, wow, this was great, thank you. 
And Jennifer's cousin's wife from Colorado <laughs> says, hi. And I wish I had, uh, I had known about this when uh, we took the Boston trails. So Jennifer, yeah. why don't we wrap it there? We, uh, it's, uh, quite, it's basically three o'clock at this point. Um, so do you have any last words for the group uh, before we uh, wrap it up? Well, I would say the next time you're in Boston, by all means, do the Freedom Trail and do the Black History Trail, but also do the Boston Women's Heritage Trail because you will be amazed at um, the contributions to women that we just don't hear about in our traditional um, history textbooks and curriculum. So the information is on our website. We would love to have you use it and follow along and um, and of course, uh, if you're in the area, you can do guided walks. Um, we do offer Boston Women's Heritage Trail guided walks. They're mostly um, given through Boston by foot uh, because we're an all volunteer organization. So there's not enough of us to give all of the tours that get requested. So if you go on Boston by foot website, um, you can do a Boston Women's Heritage Trail through Boston by foot. We'd love to have you join us. All right, well, thank you so much, Jennifer. I wanna thank the uh, 12 other libraries who partnered with Tewksbury this afternoon. We had uh, over 90 folks, uh, which is wonderful. We, uh, for a daytime program, that's pretty amazing. So wanna thank everyone. Wanna thank the Friends of the Library for their, uh, for their sponsorship. And uh, look for an email from me later today with a link to a feedback survey and a link to a recording and some information about upcoming programs that may be of interest. So thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you to all the viewers and we'll see you soon. Thank Have you. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye.